Welcome and good morning to day two of Deliver Europe and our first breakout session of the day. So here on the um, innovation stage, uh, we will now take a closer look at the post-purchase stage. We've Yesterday we've heard a lot already about the customer life cycle and all the unlocked uh, options and opportunities there. And um, its importance, of course, um, for a positive customer experience. And who <laughs> could do this better and give us some insights in there than the Deliver 2024 Customer Experience Award winner. And big applause, big applause. We have the award over here also. Uh, so please let me introduce you to Tobias Buxhold, co-founder and CEO of Parcel Lab. The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Bianca. Everybody can hear me? Okay, this is really weird. Good. Um, yes, so uh, I won't be here on my own the whole time. I have Iga with me from Bestseller. She will be joining me in just a few minutes. But before we get started, I did want to just give a more broader introduction about what post-purchase actually is and why it's important mm -hmm. uh, and really advocate um, to build great experiences for your customers. Because the best brands know, there's some of them that do that, that there is a neglected strategy for strong business growth and high efficiency. Because as a business, as a retailer, if you want to see strong growth and high efficiency, then you will have to win against competition. Means that you will have to differentiate, maybe not just on price and on product, but especially on experience, because experience is just a lever that you can use to be very different and really build loyal customers, not just based on um, what you're selling um, and at what cost. When it comes to cost, no retailer out here can afford to waste money. Yeah? And everything that's non-value adding, like customers asking, like, where's my stuff? Yeah? It's just going to be eating your margin, so that's not good. Returns, they won't go away. Yeah, they're part of the experience, but there is an opportunity to see returns more as a mean to recover and to actually create new revenue. And last but not least, but absolutely important, retention. For most retailers, it means that every single customer has to come back at least three times or more to just pay off the cost I had to acquire them. Yeah? So if you don't get that money back, obviously you cannot be running a profitable business. So how do you do all of that? You have to close the loop. And what do I mean with that? Um, many retailers today, they focus predominantly on driving a customer to buy the stuff. Yeah? They focus on the very first beginning of the journey, meaning finding a customer, pushing them through the journey all the way to making a purchase. Yeah? And they're always only being focused on that very transaction. Yeah? And everything else that follows after they've made a purchase becomes an afterthought. But when the experience is not really used to differentiate as a brand, to build loyal customers, to reduce the friction that happens along fulfillment and delivery processes, just as well as seeing returns more as an opportunity to make or save revenue, yeah? um, then this means that you will see a lower customer satisfaction rate, you will see actually high customer service cost. You will see missed revenue opportunities, which probably nobody can really afford. And overall, you're just not running a competitive business. So overall, not good. So once again, you have to close the loop. And we're talking about the post-purchase loop. Yeah? So there is one after the purchase. Because you cannot neglect your customers after they bought something. Yeah? You cannot just sit there and hope that things go well, that customers are happy, and that they then return. Yeah? You have to really step up and control and own the experience all the way through. Uh, and noted, probably in this room, with predominantly delivery people here, um, we all know this is important because it's the main that we're working in already. But I can tell you, on a company, on a strategic level, this is not known. And what it requires to do this really well is just a shift in company mindset that they stop thinking about a customer journey to be linear, as in I go find a customer, I make them purchase something, and then I start another journey, I spend money again and do it again and all over and over and over again, and instead thinking about this more in a circular way. 
yeah, or ideally like an endless wave. So how can I utilize all the touch points, all the possibilities that I have to engage with a customer post-purchase to start the next journey already? So I'm really creating this motion that I bring back customers over and over and over again. So I don't have to acquire that many new ones. So what does great look like? When we look into part of the delivery experience, um, everything that's consumer facing should be an experience that makes it unique. It should be an experience that is controlled by the brand, by the retailer. So it should be in your own ecosystem. So the, the order tracking should be on your website, right? All the communications should come from you. Um, if you have something fancy like a chatbot, these tools need to be powered by data so they can go also give relevant answers to questions. And when you do that, you should also be very, very proactive in everything that happens because we all know sometimes things go wrong, sometimes expectations are missed, but you do have a chance when you do own this part of the customer experience that you can actually mitigate those negative impacts quite dramatically if you're being proactive and helping your customers maybe even before they know. When it comes to returns, which is part of the experience, yeah, I'm not going to go away, um, it is just important to see that there cannot be a one-size-fits-all. It's really key to start thinking about this from a consumer, from a customer point of view, thinking who is that customer and what's the best experience for that specific customer. And when we start thinking about segmented flows, we, we have two examples here, two extremes. But on the left-hand side, you see the loyal VIP customer coming back and wanting to return something. Well, we know that over time, the customer lifetime value just justifies to give this person instant refund, free returns, right? Because we know they're going to coming back over and over and over again. On the right-hand side, you see that first-time buyer that just missed the 30-day return window. So no, they will not get free returns, of course. By the way, they will not even get the money back. Yeah? So they only have option to exchange or maybe get store credit. So you're actually saving the revenue and you're not losing it. Yeah? And this approach of starting to think more like how can I build out different flows, different experiences for different customer groups is just very key if you want to actually make return a revenue opportunity. Throughout it all, on every single touch point, it is also an opportunity to engage as a brand because you know exactly who the customer is, what they've bought, what's in the box, what the product can do. So you can use this to build highly personalized experiences that really set you apart as a brand. So it creates something that just sticks. You create trust, you create a relationship. So the next time that customer is looking for stuff, yeah, they don't start the journey on Google, but they just remember the good experience they had with a certain brand, and then you can retain the customer. So if you do that really, really well, this post-purchase journey and the post-purchase purchase loop, um, you can create very happy and very loyal customers. And with that, let's have a look into one of the brands that's doing that. So Iga, I would like to ask you to stage to actually talk about what you're doing today already and have also planned for the future. Iga, from Bestseller. Can you hear me well? Good. Super nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I hope I can help. <laughs> we'll try. We prepared some questions for you. Yeah? <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, so. So this is us. This is us, us two. Um, Should I start? Maybe a small introduction for you guys. So my name is Iga. I originally come from Poland, but I have been living in Denmark for the last 10 years. And that's where Bestseller, uh, the company, is based. So I will be representing one of Parcelab's customers today. Yes. And so next to just talking about yourself, uh, we all want to know about your dog. Yeah. So I got the question from Parcelab before. What do you do in your free time? And I said, you know, in e-commerce, I have to disconnect a lot because the tempo is so high. I work a lot, as probably most of you guys. So I just said, first of all, I spend time with my dog. And then they said, we want to see your dog. So, so this is her. It's Roma. <laughs> I hope a lot of you guys are dog people. So, yeah. So then I had to do something personal as well. So uh, we don't have a dog. We have actually three of those. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's how I spent my time. Uh, and past lab is just number four, I would say. So they keep me busy. And that's how I spent my free time. 
like it or not. Um, good. Um, I don't want to spend too much time about talking about us, past lab. Uh, um, I, I do care more about what you actually have experienced. And one of the questions we noted down uh, when we were prepping for this is um, talking about, so what do you think has been your best purchase experience lately? Yeah. Ooh, I shop a lot online, but of course I have to say it was one of the best seller sites. Um, I think it will be better in the future because of the work with you guys. Um, so I cannot wait to shop in, I don't know, six months when we are done with the project or so. Next week. Next week, yeah, <laughs> that will be better. Um, but I would say definitely it's the best seller brands because I work for the distribution projects team, so I'm very close to the operations and we have a lot of great partners that make the experience already good, so it can only be better. So go ahead, shop out bestseller. All right, bestseller. Can you talk a little bit about who you are as a brand? Yes. So actually, bestseller is not a brand. It's uh, a lot of brands, around 20, as you can see on the screen. Uh, maybe you know some of them. I think the next slide presents it very well. But bestseller, as I said, is a Danish family-owned company founded in the 70s. Um, very great work uh, environment for me and my colleagues who are here uh, today. Yeah. You're referring to this one? Exactly. So I guess the first two, three maybe are known to some of you guys, but there are a lot, a lot more than that. Actually, we don't even keep up as employees because some brands, some brands get open, some brands get closed. And yeah, that's why we say it's around 20. And uh, yep. that's the status for now. But a lot of work to be done, a lot of different brand experiences to be built. Exactly. Uh, um, we have quite uh, close contact with all of the brands because we at Bestseller e-commerce are the service provider. Um, and of course, it has to be unique. They have different logos. They have different style. There are also baby brands uh, for women in the pregnancy. There are also men brands. So it has to be very different. Okay. So now let me, let's get into maybe your, your own role a bit more, um, what, you, what you do at Bestseller. Um, and also maybe for the audience, what What's actually keeping you awake? So what are the challenges that you're facing and uh, dealing with? Yeah, I mean, I work for distribution, so <laughs> it is keeping me awake all the time, basically, you know, work in logistics. Um, but lately, I would say it has to be the expansion. One of our brands has very ambitious expansion plans that we have to, of course, service and help them with. Um, but another thing, of course, project with Parcel Up. We meet so often um, with, with you guys, and uh, now I became the project lead. That's why I'm also here. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, we have the scope here on screen. Um, you're very international as a business. Yeah? So not just, a, I don't know, many different brands, but they also uh, are active in very different countries with very different languages. Um, so that has a challenge in itself to actually um, cater for all of that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, as complex as it is for you to, to service it, it's the same for us on the other side, because of course this customization, we need to, to decide it together with the brand, right? So it takes time to actually roll out all the, all the features that you guys uh, have. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. So can you maybe tell us or the audience a little bit more about um, what your perspective is on post-purchase experiences and why you're actually investing in this as a brand? Yeah. Or as, as bestseller? Yes. So I think we started looking into it already a couple of years ago. It's my third time at Deliver. I remember first time we already had a few meetings here and there uh, with some other providers. But it was not the time yet. Like we were, okay, it's nice. It's nice to have, but what do we get from it? So I think it was actually quite good that we waited this one, two years to learn from the other uh, players in the market, get the business cases, get the learnings, and now we believe in it. Yep. Um, so basically the post-purchase, what I see is, just getting, being, yeah, keeping the customers happy, keeping them informed about the journey, um, easy returns, uh, limiting the returns, um, yeah. That makes sense. And what do you think is then actually needed to to stand out as? I'm not going to say bestseller, but as any of the brands that you're actually helping with. Mm. Yeah. So I think as a brand, especially in fashion, you can. You can stand out in many different ways, like the designs can be different, right? But it's not the core where me and my team work at. Then it's the operations, it's the fulfillment and, and uh, yeah, the whole journey after, right? Because that's where the distribution part uh, comes into play. And it's not only logistics from A to B, it's, it's all that what Parcel Lab can also offer. Yes, I can only obviously confirm that, that it's important to just yeah. taking care of them uh, every step of the way, for sure. Um, 
let's let's have a look at what you're actually doing today. Um, so you're on a journey with us. Yeah, so uh, not everything is done and it never will be. Um, but we, we have started the journey. Um, and you actually started with um, returns. Yes. Yeah, so that was the first step that you did. Um, what are you doing here? And, and, and why is that also different to what you have done before? Mm. So we already had an online return portal with uh, another provider before, but there were two crucial things for us to, to be changed that you guys are able to provide. First of all, is staying in the bestseller or the my account universe so that the customer doesn't have to go to an external page. We really wanted to keep it in our universe. So they, it's easy to, of course, for the customer and also to keep them uh, uh, in that. And uh, the other very important thing is the customization. We have around these 20 brands. How how else would we be able to do that? It's, it's not one size fits all, uh, as I mentioned before. So yeah. these two these two factors for sure yeah so you're, you're actually building out not just specific like like one bestseller return portal that every of your brand can use but actually every single brand can adjust and configure this according to their needs whether it's i don't know a regional need or a more brand requirement that can then be reflected in, in exactly so all the brands will have access to the yeah part of the admin portal that you yeah. provide and uh, so they are able to change the wording um, of the messaging to the customers of the returns they are able to change the coloring uh, it's all up to them in the end yeah yeah and um, what we do see here on the screen as well is that it's it's not just the returns portal the, the digital returns management is more than just a portal where you can register your return but it's it's also the the communication around it right so whether you need to to distribute the the label or qr code whatever it might be um but also maybe more brand content um around what Whatever kind of engagement you want to drive throughout the return journey. Exactly. So it's not only, okay, this is a way to return. We need to get the item back. That's one thing. But we can also use it for advertising in the future, right? So we can put some marketing content in the, in the emails as well. And that's already the plan for the next phase of the project, yep. uh, as I know. Yeah. Another thing is the exchanges and gift cards that you also mentioned yep. uh, in the beginning. Uh, that is a super nice uh, feature that I don't think that many players have uh, already. So I'm super excited to, to get started with that. Yes, uh, I, I also know that it's quite shocking to see how many retailers actually are not using the functionality to exchange and maybe offer gift cards instead of just immediate refunds. Uh, we know why that is the case, right? It's just very complicated. There's a lot of systems and things that need to fall in place to actually make that happen for sure. Um, but the business value that you get from it uh, to not lose that revenue and actually try to recover and upsell on that if you do it well um, it's just a huge opportunity that we see more and more brands picking up but it's still early um, in the market yeah. yeah so let's see as you know we have a workshop next week with parcel app together with one of our biggest brands that really is pushing for the for the feature so i hope it, it can come become a reality for us okay we'll try our best switch gears a little bit um there's another important element for post-purchase, which is not immediately customer-facing as in like the digital experience, but it has a tremendous role to play. And this is the customer service. So when, when customers actually do have questions, so they do sh show up, I don't know, at your hotline or whatever, um, they need to be answered in an efficient way. Um, what you're doing is you're using all the data actually channeled through your existing customer service tool, which is Zendesk mm. in that case. Um, so your customer service people do what and why do they use it? Yeah, so we are live with the Zendesk integration, meaning that the customers, uh, customer service uh, teams have it much easier these days because they have one system where they see all the data, as you said, that is fed from, from Parcelab. Um, they love it uh, already. They have been using it for, for a few months. And then the chatbot. That's the second thing that our customer service are already using. And of course, there are some questions where it has to be a human being, hopefully, that can answer, right? Uh, but I know there are a lot where actually the chatbot is helping. Where is my uh, order? When will I get my refund, etc.? That can all be answered thanks to the data that you provide. Yeah. So, of course, we are working together to try to 
reduce the amount of inquiries as much as we can already, but then some will just get through, right? Of so course. You, you got to make sure that um, the agents are capable of answering them. Um, we, we do know this from, from other um, customers like IKEA is one example. It's a bit more complex supply chain setup, uh, but they've been able to reduce the amount it takes to answer a question by two minutes. Yeah? So that's a big number. Um, if you can just have one single place where you go and you have all the information at your fingertips to answer a question that a customer has, so you don't have to switch between different systems, go to a carrier website or whatever the setup might be, but just consolidate this in one place and make it also very easily understandable for customer service people because they're not quite necessarily logistics experts. So no. if you just give them the raw data, um, that might not necessarily help, but uh, they need to have the answer and exactly. yeah, not the data. And also, um, if they are searching for uh, yeah, information about the parcel that is lost, etc. previously we know it was done on each separate carrier site, right? Whereas now they have the portal of yeah. uh, Parcel App. It's also, again, one, one process, one place where they can check uh, all the information. Saving time, yeah. You mentioned your chatbot. Uh, I think that's a great example. Uh, what we can see on your live uh, on your on your website today, um, and this chatbot is connected to the same data. Mm. Yeah, so um, first of all, it's probably good to give the same answers depending on who you ask. Yeah, so <laughs> you don't get different answers depending on where you where you where you're checking. Um, but customers can go to your website and just ask like. With my order. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I think, the most asked question to customer service, right? Where is my order? Is it the and number one question? Yeah. And that's precisely the one that can be answered with a chatbot. Um, that is probably also good for your customer service people because then they can focus on something that's a bit more exactly. value adding. And that's the feedback that we already get. That's why they are so happy for Parcel App already that, okay, we can actually move on with the projects that we're waiting. We can actually use the potential of the people that are there because the chatbot is helping so much uh, with uh, answering these basic inquiries. Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually have customers once in a while come up to us um, absolutely wanting to go live before peak because they know when they have these kind of functionalities, then they don't need to hire ex extra people. Yeah? Um, so it's an immediate impact if you actually do provide that kind of data or reduce the amount of inquiries in the first yeah. place. It's live now and I hope we, before peak we can get the learnings and then assess whether yeah. we need some more colleagues or whether it's enough with, yes. uh, with the chatbot. Yeah. Yeah. What's not live? and we have to talk about a story here in a minute as well, um, is the communication around the delivery. Um, it's in testing, right? It's, it's, it's built, but it's yes. not live yet. Um, can you maybe just walk the audience through why this is also important for us and, and why you're actually building this? Yeah. So again, communication, all the, all the touch points to the customers, as you mentioned in your introduction, it's, it's super important. That also limits the questions of where is my order, right? Because all the transactional emails on the way uh, customers would get. And again, it's customized per brand. Um, so you can get the, the touch and feel of, of each of our brands. Yep, yep. Um, and these emails also lead to this tracking page. Yeah, so it's a, that's a name it example. Yeah. Um, but uh, as, as we alluded to before, this is also now sitting in your own ecosystem on your own website. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. And this is live as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Both for the guest customers, so you don't have to log in, but also when you log in and go under my account, you have the, the tracking page already live. Great. So what happens now when things go wrong? Or in the future? What will happen in the future when things go wrong? Yeah, and in logistics, things uh, go wrong, yeah, unfortunately, from time to time. So um, what we can do is to be proactive mm -hmm. with Parcel App. And uh, one way how to do it is that we can communicate and be proactive about any delays or exceptions. Let's say a pallet is stuck on, on customs. We know it because there are no scans for, let's say, two days. Mm -hmm. Then we can set a rule and send out an email communication to our customers saying, hey, sorry, uh, your parcel is stuck in, in customs. Please expect a delay. And then again, we don't hope that the customer would contact customer service because they already know what's happening. So they have more patience now. Um, that's at least our uh, yeah. expectation to it. Yeah. So we had a thing planned for yesterday. Uh, where well, we spoke with Iga before. Um, well, we wanted to give away some, um, was it Jack and Jones? Yeah. Jack and Jones beanies uh, at our booth. And so we ordered them and they arrived too late. So the event invite that you see here, uh, forget about it, it's worthless, uh, but we wanted to do it. Uh, so we had good intentions. So it didn't arrive on time, so we could take it actually in our suitcase and get it here. 
Um, that sucked. That sucked. And yeah. whose fault is it now? Yeah, there are many at fault here, I would say. <laughs> they were ordered too late, first of all. They were ordered to UK with the customs. They should have been ordered here. It would be much easier because Jack and Jones warehouse is actually in the Netherlands, very close from here. So we could even drive up there. But yeah. anyway, we didn't have the hats. It's too late now. But um, what's your point here? Yeah, so I spoke with the team and they said, well, it said, I think, one to four days on the website that it's going to be delivered on. Two to four two days. To four days. Um, which we then calculated and, and said that's probably going to work. So okay, you're optimistic then. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're just a dumb customer. We don't know, right? Yeah, we have no yeah. idea how this works. So uh, we just hoped that it works. It did not work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, as you said, it did not work because yeah. there's one feature that you guys can provide, right? And yeah. that's the predictive delivery date that we are working on and testing right now in Denmark. So it's going to be also live soon where is based on machine learning, right? Yes. Uh, AI. Um, so the tool is learning on how good or bad we are in, yeah. the, in each of the countries. And then it's not going to say two to four days, but probably maybe three to five if it's the reality at that point of time, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. So yeah. next time you can get your hats, uh, whatever you need at yeah. uh, the right time. Yeah. So we're just going to return them now. It's OK. No, you cannot. No, <laughs> I'm not going to accept it. I know your order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not uh, it's not gonna be accepted. Okay, you can return it but you're not getting the refund, yeah? <laughs> Is that okay? Then uh, no, please go ahead. We actually had an idea just over over breakfast this morning. Um for everyone who's still keen for a beanie because we have them now and we You have them now? Don't wanna return them, don't worry. Yeah. Um but if you come to our booth, uh, we'll actually get you one. Uh, we ship it to you and you'll have a great experience. We just wait until you're alive. Um and then you get a great experience. But Super just nice. show up and we'll we'll get you one. I will um, show up there. Yeah. But <laughs> Anyways, no, but it's 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 a good point, right? So post purchase experience uh, is is not just one thing. It's not just returns or just delivery communication or whatever, right? But it really starts with setting a clear expectation at the very beginning of the process, and then following through on that expectation, monitoring, measuring. Um, it it requires some technology to mm. make a good forecast already very early on, right? But then it also requires technology to to monitor that at scale and act on it, yeah? Yeah. So, uh, be proactive, um, knowing for each customer. So what, what's the specific expectation for that customer? And then also like, how do I pull that through, through each part of the journey? Um, and yeah, probably for us, we shouldn't be eligible for a refund. Yeah. Because that's just our own fault. Exactly. And, yeah, maybe yeah. We shouldn't. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Um, that makes sense. Cool. Um, back to the questions. Um, yes. So you ship globally, mm. yeah, you, you're a big international business. Um, can you talk us through the complexities um, that you actually see with um, uh, operating such a setup? Yeah. So globally is a, yeah, maybe a too big word for now uh, because mostly we ship in Europe. We also ship to US with yep. one of the brands. But I also mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that it's very tough with the ambitious expansion plans so it's gonna come so i wouldn't say that it's super complex for bestseller as is because we have so great partners in all of the countries and uh, they are even sitting here um, but it's gonna come the complexities are gonna come because we are going live with uae very soon mm -hmm. We have plans for South Korea, Japan, and actually up to 100 countries within three years. Um, so then, yeah, we have, I think both of us or both parties, we have a lot of uh, stuff to do in terms of the creating the setup, right? Creating all the languages and the emails, and also the new sub brands that uh, some of our main brands are coming up with. So it has been calmer until now, but I think it's really picking up these days. Yeah. So the complexities are just around the corner. Yeah. and. Uh, very likely we will also see the underlying complexities in your supply chain, right? Because you have different partners in many countries. Exactly. You know, so different integrations, different data sets, uh, different sources, all things you have to somehow put together, like tie all those loose ends together to then being able to come up with a, a at least for the consumer, a, a seamless experience on the front end. Yeah? yeah, and I would say maybe not complexity, but limitation usually is IT and tech. So uh, We've heard that before. Yes, having an ambitious roadmap, that's one thing, but also being able to fulfill it, uh, that's another, right? So as easy integration-wise as possible, that's what we, of course, want to go for because 100 countries in three years, it's, it's very uh, 
Yeah, it will be a challenge. Under contest in three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. the plan. Yeah, all right, let's go. Um, so this this is this is today, right? So this is what we we are doing and have done today. Um, what does the future look like for bestseller when it comes to post purchase experience? Mm. So we have invested a lot in it, mm -hmm. both uh, money and time. Yeah. Uh, we are building the relationship with you guys. So I now I'm lead of the of the project. So I hope it's gone. It's here to stay. Uh, I hope it's here to uh, to progress. And as soon as we are done with the features that we just talked you through, uh, there are next ones coming. I hope a lot of them are already ready, like the exchanges and gift cards. That's the first one that we want to run after. Integration with Trustpilot um, on our communication emails to the customers. And I hope many more, but maybe you can tell me uh, a bit more about that. What is there to, to look forward to? Well, yeah, well, definitely all the effort we have to go through for all the countries and brands, right? So just multiplying what we've set up with the first brands to exactly. just get yeah. this out at scale. That's going to be a big one for sure. Um, the estimated delivery date on the on the on the product page, uh, as well as like the checkout, uh, obviously that will be a a major shift. Yeah. Uh, Claims management as well. I know that uh, that you can management. provide that, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, to limit to limit our claims. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then um, you, you touch slightly on one topic around marketing content, mm -hmm. um, and maybe we we don't have it on the slides because it's not yet um, uh, live with bestseller yet. Um, but what we also talked about is that all those touch points obviously are a chance to not just share information but also create this customer engagement. Um, and uh, we have this one tool; it's called Campaign Manager, where you can actually create campaign specifically for certain audiences within your customer base where you can promote products yeah, if you want to, uh, but you can also just promote your brand or maybe certain things that are happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. That you just very quickly can make adjustments to those emails and tracking pages and returns portals and whatever. Uh, because what we have found in the past was that this used to be very rigid, static, right, hard to change. Um, and since you have so much eyes on it, right? Your, your customers are checking orders usually around five times, right? And there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, interest and attention towards these touch points. You can really use them to, well, build this relationship, build your brand, your brand value, but also then start this, the next journey already somehow, yeah? Pushing them into your social channels, pushing them into your VIP program, um, or maybe just getting them to buy the next item yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. So those are yeah. opportunities that we would uh, yeah, really love you guys to see pick up as well. We really work on uh, increasing the conversion rate in, in bestseller e-commerce uh, as a group and uh, yeah, retain, attract and retain the customers, yep. which is an art in itself, but uh, that's our focus these days. Great. That's the end of the questions that we had prepared. Are there any from the audience where we can help with? That's one over here. Good morning and thank you for the presentation this morning. One point that I'm interested to hear more is I saw on one slide the possibility to give to the customer to interact directly with uh, instant messaging from the, um, the screen of, of, of Parcel Lab. Is, how do you funnel that communications with your uh, chatbot? Let's wait for it. It's, it's not on that slide, it's one, one I think before. Uh, so, like this one. So, the example of Kim. She's texting on that page. Is it on the landing page of Parcel Lab? And you funnel that with your customer service? How does it work? So I believe that the chatbot you can access, of course, directly from our sites. But the technical side of it, I guess it's a question to you. If uh, This is just an email. All right. It's an email. Okay. An email coming. It can also be a call. So somehow the customer is reaching out to the customer service people through any kind of channel that they're offering. It can also be a chatbot if it's not the automated part, but like the, the, the manual part where a human being is interacting through the chat. Yeah, it's not a chat, but it's a chat then. Um, so it doesn't matter which channel this inquiry is coming through, but the moment it actually hits the agent, they will be able to pull the data or have it populated automatically and then answer the questions. Is that okay. Yeah. Clear. Okay. Thank you. 
questions from the audience. I think I saw some hand in the back. Hi, I'm coming from Pandora. I have a question, nothing more for you. Yeah. With how did you approach this internally with actually building the business case, getting the right support that this is the direction we have to go to? Yeah, very good question. So it also tackles into what I said that in the beginning, it was a hard no. It was like, it's nice to have, nice to meet these guys that deliver, but that's it. Um, but after some time, I think we have seen our competitors doing that. So we knew, okay, they are working with ParcelUp, maybe these guys are working with someone else. Okay, it starts to be interesting in the market. Um, and then actually the market itself helped us, right? Because there was such a, okay, there was growth during COVID. Then there was focus only on profitability, only EBIT, no, t no focus on top line. But then suddenly we got quite some money uh, on the bottom line. So we were then able to reinvest again. Um, so I think then we thought, okay, now is the time. This is, we have the space to invest in something. We were looking into it for one, two years. Um, and we just yeah, prepared the business case. We also got the business case from ParcelUp, what they do with uh, one of their big customers as well. And uh, they just agreed. So I'm super happy for it that I can be part of it now. Yeah. It's, it's a very fair question because it's still new. Yeah, so for many brands, it means it's like the first time they're looking into this. I don't have any experience and what it means. Um, so we're doing a lot of education work, and this is also why we're sitting here to just explain um, how also the business value actually is created through this kind of communication. Yeah, so whether it's cost reduction in customer service, whether it's revenue opportunities um, that you generate, or I personally believe the, the biggest impact we will have is just overall customer lifetime value. Uh, almost impossible to measure uh, or it just take months and years to, to get there. Um, but if you do just make sure that you create happy customers and that they are connected to your brand and like to come back, like this will just over time pay off. So uh, hard to put in the business case, but personally, um, I think absolutely inevitable if you want to uh, grow sustainably as a business. Yeah. And that all makes completely sense. So what do you think is the main reason or what is holding um, retailers back to use this? Investment, first of all, uh, maybe not everyone, not every company is ready for it. Also, maybe some are still in this mindset that we were, okay, it's nice to have, but actually do we need it? Um, what else do you think? Well, it's cross-functional. So uh, this is not a single team that can pull that off. Um, and everything cross-functional becomes sometimes political, sometimes painful, uh, because you have to win other people in the organization as well to, to make this happen. Um, what we always say is that, yes, that's true, but in the end, the consumer doesn't care. Right? They just look at it from the outside, they see one experience, and of course, different teams need to play together to make it work, um, but it is effort internally, uh, and you gotta think of doing I don't know, a tremendous job there to just pull the people together that need to be pulled together. Yeah. And you do need also strategic buy-in that they believe this post-purchase piece is something where we need to invest. We can't just neglect our customers. Yeah. We can't just build on hope, uh, but we need to close that gap and we need to have a really end-to-end -end experience fully managed through. So this, these internal hurdles to get multiple teams rallied for this and get the budget um, is something that we do see from the outside always being very challenging as well. And there's some retailers doing it really well and some not so. Yeah, but I would say we at Besser, we are very lucky with possibilities to invest and also the overall strategy in Besser e-commerce that says, okay, we focus on the conversion rate, we focus on bringing the customers back, uh, so attracting and retaining. So this project, this cooperation fits very well into the strategy that we have. So there's no one that can question me in the company, why are we spending so much money on it? No, it's worth it and it's going to bring a quick return on investment as well. Sounds great. I think it, you were very lucky to find each other. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Last chance. Okay, great. So uh, from your side, um, to close this, any tips for the retailers in this room? Just, or how would you, you know, yeah. find any? Deep depends uh, where you are on in the journey but definitely talk to uh, yeah 
see what is out there in the market. Of course, I'm here to represent Parcela because that I can vouch for them now. Um, but see what is there in the market and really um, check that the, if it's online business, check the journeys that you have right now and really ask yourself, is it how I would like to be treated as a customer? Is it enough that I'm doing? Would I know, would like to know more? Would I like to have an easier return process, etc.? So just be curious and uh, yeah, there are possibilities out there for sure. And I, and I might be a little bit biased, um, but <laughs> I obviously believe that it's absolutely necessary for every retailer to have this. Yeah, I, I cannot see a world where you're not doing this and still strive as a business, right? It's just, it's just like a leaking bucket, right? If you're churning customers, if, if you're not making them happy, like, yes, maybe it, you can make it work somehow, but to me, it doesn't make any sense. So maybe the one advice tip that I can give is maybe you will have to do it at some stage. Yeah? Um, the earlier you start, better it will be for your business and the more you can actually differentiate today already uh, than maybe just following uh, your competitors that might already be doing this. Yeah? So um, I know it's a bit biased opinion, but um, that's what I think. Okay, thank you, Toby and Iga. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Nice.